Hey, what's up, world, and welcome to episode 143 of the Take One Podcast. I am your host, August C. Jones, and today we have a lot to talk about. So I'm going to be getting into Trolls World Tour and its rentals and how it's doing and all that stuff, as well as Georgia is talking about reopening theaters as well as certain other venues. And we're going to talk about that as well as some of the WWE latest firings that the company had to do because of the current situation. What's new to rent on the stream as well as a movie review on Spencer Confidential, which is currently on Netflix. So let's start off with talking about Trolls World Tour. Now, there is no secret as to what we're going through in our daily lives right now. Everything is shut down. Well, a lot of places are shut down. Businesses can't operate and they're losing money and all that stuff. And there's a lot of places that are affected due to the circumstances. And one of the places are movie theaters who uh, have been shut down for like, what, basically like a month now. And um, certain theaters are just going through it. AMC is basically at the top of the list of a theater that may not open back up when things are allowed to open back up. And so with that, um, Universal decided to take one of their properties, Trolls uh, World Tour, uh, one of their movies, and because it's not going to be shown in theaters, besides taking it off the release date and maybe pushing it down further down the line like a lot of studios have been doing, they decided to put it for VOD at a rental fee of $20 for a 48 hour period if you start watching it, but you could keep it for 30 days unwatched and you have a whole month in order to watch it. <laughs> now, with that said, that came out Easter weekend. I seen World, um, Trolls World Tour. My review was up on my channel. You can go ahead and check that out. I'm gonna put the link in the description. And so, in a sense, I guess you could say, this is like a testing ground to see if movies, big movies, can, you know, thrive on VOD releases and can, you know, in the future, studios take their big tentpole movies, take them from where, you know, they would have made a lot of money on the movies in the theaters. Can they put them straight to streaming or VOD and can they make the same amount of money? I already gave my thoughts on it, why it wouldn't work. And I have some more thoughts. I'm not going to get into it too much on this podcast, but I will make a separate video just explaining like what, like how I think that that could happen. But in any case, Trolls World Tour, uh, one of the things that basically were, was a problem was, as I stated before, privacy, uh, piracy. Um, if you even like bringing it out for rental fee of $20 or whatever, a lot of people, it's going to make it easier for them to record it and just distribute it throughout the internet and everything else for people to watch and they don't have to pay the $20. But a lot of people don't want to do that. They want a good, clean copy and all that stuff. So a lot of households have been renting the movie and not only renting the movie like one time, They've rented it maybe three or four times after that, which is a lot of money. It is a lot of money when you look at it. $20 per rental. The you know, And the main reason is because these are the people that have kids. I can't see a grown adult paying, 25, paying $20 three times to rewatch Trolls World Tour. That floats your boat, that floats your boat. But in any case... Uh, a lot of these households have children that loves these movies. My uh, friend, actually, I know like several people. Uh, my sister have kids that more than likely will want to rewatch Trolls World Tour. You know, um, I have a uh, a friend. She likes these movies, and she would not she would not mind buying this for her and her son. And I have another friend, a coworker, whose daughter loves the movie. So you got people like that that have kids that just want to watch and rewatch. And that's where the problem comes in with the $20 rental fee. But at the same time, it doesn't pay, pose really too big of a problem as of yet. Because parents have been spending the money and a lot of them just look at it as like, yo, this is for my child. If my child is happy, it's good. And then a lot of times I, I even read a tweet about somebody uh, basically saying that, 
this was like a gold mine because their kids fighting all that stuff and this was the only thing that really set them down it kept them quiet for like an hour and a half plus so i mean a lot of parents are kind of like benefiting from it and so far this movie has did over 50 million within the first six days of it being released now that's not saying too much that's not saying too much because the the numbers when you look on the internet is kind of like weird or whatever but it's like the budget is 90 to 100 million and even before uh everything happened it wasn't really like like, I don't know, like the studios wasn't expecting for it to do more than the first film. They expected it to do like, what, uh, 20 to $35 million open, opening or whatever. They didn't expect it to do too much anyway. So I guess in their line of thinking, it was that this is the perfect time to, you know, play some movie out like this and see if this actually works. Let it be the guinea pig. And so far, it, it looks like it could work in some cases. But the only thing is, is that this is special circumstances. Like, so it, it's like putting this out when people are able to go to the movie theaters is a totally different monster. But as of right now, it's showing certain numbers, you know, that it can work. It shows that it can work. Uh, and can this work for other movies? Like I said this is special circumstances that people are in doors majority of the time certain people can't work can't go to a, a job that is essential like uh work that they actually can still go to work certain people are stuck at the crib a lot of them are stuck at the crib with their kids so when it comes down to this we'll have to maybe a movie studio could do this in the future to see how it goes maybe another test but this will go down in history as a movie the first movie to do something like this uh at, like a major film i mean i know other movies have done it where they had simultaneous you can rent it on vod as well as see it in theaters but those were movies that were like indie and you know low budget and stuff so when it comes down to it this is really just the first start of it and i guess we'll have to see where it goes but right now i mean it's doing successfully uh in the vod marketing marketing or whatever in the market or whatever and how it's going to fare you know long term we'll see but they're keeping their eyes on the numbers and just how it's doing through like rentals and all that stuff but uh i think this is kind of good for right now but i don't know I, I still have my doubts of you know vod being sent straight to B vod big budgeted movies not really having you know a good footing in that market as well you know to make the money back that they put into marketing and just the budget of the movie so i don't know we'll see we'll see now to kind of like segue from that in a related matter georgia is set to reopen movie theaters as early as next week so yeah so april 27th is the day that georgia is trying to open up or reopen up movie theaters even though it is ranked number 11 in the nation regards to cv cases which the number is around like 18.9 thousand in addition to 733 deaths they are still talking about reopening the uh theaters as well as private um social clubs and restaurants with dining services or whatever are allowed to reopen. But bars, nightclubs, amusement park rides, and live performance venues will remain closed. But also, um, starting this Friday, they're saying that gyms, fitness centers, bowling alleys, beauty and salons, barbershops, body art studios can uh, open up for, you know, business. And I'm, I'm just, I'm going to give my opinion on this because in reading this article it was kind of like uh i don't know i don't know if it's gonna happen but this is what they're trying to do and governor brian kemp is saying that georgia is on track with the phase one plateau of the white house guidelines uh but in order for it to hit a phase one a state to hit phase one it has to either show low document uh cases 
of uh, CV or show that there is low testing of CV within a 14 day period. And even if big venues do open, they can only operate under the strict physical uh, social distancing protocol. So they still are limited to what they can do. So it's not like they could just bam, you know, just boom, throw like a thousand people within a closed space or whatever. They still have to adhere to uh, certain protocols in order to operate or else they will be shut down. And the governor, uh, Brian Kemp, uh, he is getting a lot of backlash due to it being basically <laughs> possibly being responsible for possible future deaths or uh, an uprise in cases. And he responded to the criticism saying, I will say that when we have more people moving around, we probably will see our cases continue to go up, but we're a lot better prepared for that than we were a month ago. And that is concerning. It's not really giving good security to people's minds and uh, to where they will be eager to go back to the movie theaters as soon as next week. Because with all this stuff still looming around people's heads, places are still closed down that, you know, need to have like money coming in on a daily basis in order for, you know, it to like, you know, continue to stay open. It's like you're basically giving us hope, but then saying, but, you know, give us a reason for us to want to go back. You're basically saying that, yeah, these places are going to be opening up and there still may be a case to where you're going to catch CV. But hey, you know, this and like, no, that that's why I don't really feel like theaters will open back up in Georgia starting next week and certain places are still going to remain closed. Uh, I think certain like privately owned or, you know, uh, just owners are just going to look at it as like, I'll take the loss because if somebody get it in my work of place, it's going to look bad on my business. So even when stuff start, start opening back up, you're still going to have people that may have went there kind of like, uh, let me stay away from there. Cause they did have like a few cases or at least one case in that place. So it's like that really doesn't bring any type of security. It's like we're saying we're still out there. There's a chance that you might catch CV, but you could still go see a movie. Like it just doesn't really, it, I don't know. Like it just seems selfish. Like, you know, you want to look good and you're going to do it by any means possible. So I don't know. I feel like they should remain closed theaters in certain places that are still closed uh, to today and all the stuff should remain closed until things not only in just one state, but a few states start looking better, you know, and the numbers are significantly down or just completely significantly down and then go from there. But as of right now, that's just really not, um, you're still not saying that it's safe to do these things. You're saying that like you can go, you might get it, you know, this and that. It's like we're not guinea pigs. So I don't know. That, that just sounds stupid. He, Yeah, it just. <laughs> but in any case, I'm not going to rant anymore on that. But that was just my opinion on that whole situation. But hopefully sometime within the next months, it will get better and theaters can reopen and in a better like situation to where it's not a high chance that us as patrons to these uh, places, health isn't at risk because a lot of us have old people that we uh, see on a daily basis or, you know, every so often or young kids and even just young people who body can't, you know, handle the virus, you know, we can't afford to have them catch it and then lose somebody close to us. So give us a better situation to go to the movies other than that. I mean, I'm not in Georgia, but still it's stupid. But in any case, continuing with the effects that uh, CV is having on a business nonetheless. So WWE has released a lot of uh, talent, uh, both on screen and uh, behind the scenes. And this is shortly after being deemed an essential business. So now they can still continue to operate on like live TV and all that stuff, even though they are uh, doing certain preparations to where they don't have to have like wrestlers, you know, go back and forth every single week. They're going to start implementing like tapes, uh, Raw's and Smackdown's and NXT's to where it can limit that or whatnot, even though 
I myself and I feel like a lot of other people they they, they feel like WWE should shut down but just like any other big business like they really can't afford to shut down but on the heels of that they released a lot of talent certain talent that I'm like yeah they should have released but then certain ones I'm like maybe they should have kept you know whatever but I mean they probably just you know had their reasons for certain like people whatever even though they spent a lot of money within the past few years of acquiring a whole bunch of talent that they're not even using that literally are either just sitting in the back or just sitting at home and getting paid for just doing nothing but in any case so uh the list goes as follows and I probably might you know, have missed certain names, but these are the names that I had written down. Uh, Kurt Hawkins, Kurt Angle, Eric Rowan, Drake Maverick, which made a video tweet talking about the firing. And it was just him in front of the camera just showing, like, just really emotional uh, how he felt about the whole situation. And that uh, WWE is still allowing him to compete in the Cruiserweight Tournament. But after the, I believe, three matches that he is going to be a part of, he's... No, he's done with the company and uh gallows and anderson which i'm like really gallows and anderson but okay uh zach Ryder, heath slater ec3 leo rush rusev uh eric young sarah logan no way jose mike and maria canellis aiden english primo and epico uh and is and, and as well as and like I'm gonna get to like just my thoughts on it, but um as well as other producers, which is Lance Storm, Fit Finley, Sarah Stock, uh Mike Rotunda, Shane Helms, and a few other people, whatever. And this is just crazy. Like I feel like Gallows and Anderson, even though they're not they weren't utilized like how I myself and a lot of other wrestling fans uh feel like they should have been utilized. I don't think that those two shouldn't have been one of the shouldn't have been like any person that should have got released from WWE with all this stuff. Um, certain ones I could see: Kurt Hawkins, Zack Ryder, uh, Heath Slater, um, Leo Rush, uh, Eric Young, No Way Jose, uh, Mike and Maria Canellis, Aiden English, Primo Epico. I could see those names because you know those are like just people that if even if you watch WWE on a regular basis, you probably didn't forget about certain people. I forgot all about Mike and uh, Maria Canellis. I forgot all about them. Uh, Sarah Logan wasn't really too light, and she wasn't really a big player anyway. So, and I'm not saying this. I'm not saying this and saying, like, it is. it sucks that people are losing their jobs. Certain people, like myself, are, you know being put in a place to where my job is shut down. But as soon as things get back up and running, I can go back to work. I don't want to, <laughs> but I at least still have a job, you know, and certain people are still, you know, getting paid at least for a little while through their job. And it, it sucks that people are losing their jobs. It don't matter what what type of like level you, is, you are at um, that certain workplace. It sucks that you are losing your job, especially in a situation like this is. But it's understandable due to the fact that of everything that's going on. Like they have to cut certain things in order to reserve money for when they get back, you know, going. That way they won't go broke. And but I know a lot of people be, believe that, you know, they have certain like ulterior motives as to why a lot of these wrestlers get, you know, uh, shit cans. But in any case, however you might look at it, WWE, you know, they more than likely, and I don't have proof, but more than likely don't practice legit business, uh, you know, uh, uh, dealings or whatever. I'm not saying that they're crooked, but, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that they do is like, yeah, they, they kind of like, you know, uh, are not doing it right. But in any case... They were going to have to do this anyway. You know, firings was inevitable. Like, this is something that was more than likely guaranteed going to happen. Whether or not you feel like they were wrong in doing it or right in doing it, certain businesses still have to do that. Certain businesses around have to fire certain employees, like, to keep, you know, their business going. 
And, you know, you can argue the fact that maybe they should be shut down. That way they could keep the, you know, employees and blah, blah, blah and all that stuff. But we're not behind the scenes seeing all the behind the scenes daily businesses, the financial situation and, you know, what they can and can't do. So we can only have our opinion to what we're reading about and what we're seeing. And it's like maybe they had to, like legitimately had to, whether you like WWE or the people behind it or not. It's like they more than likely had to. Now, some of it probably was selfish decisions, whatever. But, I mean, it, it is a business and they had to keep going. And in order to keep going, they had to reserve money. And that's where a lot of, lot of like, big businesses are doing. You know, they have to cut their losses, stop paying people, you know. And they those people have to get unemployment until, you know, that business is back up and running. So, I mean, it, it's just crazy just to uh, see that they're doing this. I mean, and... WWE isn't, you know, Vince McMahon isn't just coming off of this, you know, crazy looking squeaky clean because it's like, and I'm going to touch on this real briefly because I'm going to jump into the other uh, subjects, but it's like his XFL thing is not working again. I don't even know if he's going to be able to bring it back up, but, you know, he, he, he went at it before and it, it failed miserably and it looked like he had a good head on his shoulders trying to start it up and, you know, do you know, trying to like do it right. And then all of a sudden this hit and now he was forced to stop all operations and even fire people. So, I mean, he's not coming out, you know, squeaky clean, but I mean, he's not jobless, you know? So, I mean, think of how you want to think on it or whatnot, but I feel like it was inevitable that this stuff was going to happen, that it was going to have to happen. And it's sad to see that, you know, this stuff did happen, but Oh man, I mean, a lot of a lot of talent needed to be let go for the simple fact that they wasn't really doing too much about it. Like I said, I forgot about Mike and uh, Maria Canellis. I don't watch WWE on a daily basis, but even in the podcasts that I listen to, you know, they haven't mentioned them in a long time. So it's like, I mean, even without all this stuff happening, like you know, one of the things that you needed to do is release the talent if you're not going to lose them. Because you were only literally getting all this talent because you didn't want them going to AEW or any other place and making money. You wanted to control all the aspects. So one of the ways to do it is to get all the talent. That way they don't have anywhere else to go. You know, so I mean, it's whatever. <laughs> I'm not going to blame you if you have other, you know, uh, thoughts about it. And there's mainly negative thoughts I'm not going to blame you. I'm not going to go against you. But, hey, I mean, it is what it is. It's sad to see, but, hey. So, with that out the way, let's jump right into everything that's new to rent on the stream. And for digital, tomorrow will be available is Wendy, which is kind of like a new take on the uh, Peter Pan story, but it follows the uh, girl Wendy. And for physical release is uh, Bad Boys for Life, The Gentleman, Like a Boss, an attorney all which i have reviews for and i'm gonna put the links for the description uh below and uh you can go ahead and check out my thoughts and everything else but those are the movies that are for digital release and physical release tomorrow now to end off the podcast let's jump real quick right into a movie review which is netflix's one of Netflix's newest movies called Spencer Confidential. Now, this movie stars Mark Wahlberg, Winston Duke, uh, Eliza Swessinger, uh, Alan Arkin, and Bo Keem Woodbine. And this movie is about an ex-cop who was locked up because of an assault incident involving him and his police chief. Once released, he's still hated amongst other police. But when he hears about the killings of two police officers, it pushes him to an investigation. Teamed up with an inspiring MMA fighter, he looks to bring justice to one of the officer's family and shed light on the corruption in the police department. Now, just right off the bat, this is a Netflix film, so it is 50-50. <laughs> um, but um, this movie was decent you know it's a movie to cut on if you don't have anything else to watch and you know you just want to watch something new it's one of those type of movies uh the humor in this movie because it's kind of like a uh i guess you could say buddy cop type thing but not really and it has like a comedy uh aspect to it but a lot of the comedy did not work and it could have been executed better like one of the times that mark Wahlberg and um winston duke's character meet 
it could have been a really funny scene, but it's like the humor was restricted, you know, like they wanted to push the boundaries, but then kind of like, you know, held back. But it's not completely void of humor. It does have some funny moments, but not enough to say that, like, this is a laugh out loud type of movie. Uh, Mark Wahlberg did a decently good job, but wasn't anything too exciting. Uh, Elisa Schlesinger was more of a standout than Mark Wahlberg was and kind of had a little bit more to work with. But she was just okay as well. Um, she wasn't anything spectacular. Uh, but I did like their interactions and their relationship between their characters, Spencer and Sissy. Um, it was actually a little bit entertaining. And I wish that I could have seen a movie just revolving around that. That seemed like that would have been more of a better movie. Um, and it is a one FBI agent that is literally over the top and more over the top than what he probably needed to be um but overall the uh other acting was uh okay pretty decent um as a movie it was just okay it was nothing truly special uh to see and I, when you see a lot of movies you can tell whether the movie was made for vod or if a movie was made to be in theaters and this is definitely one that was made to just be a streaming type of movie because it really didn't hit no barriers. It wasn't anything, like I said, too special. But it wasn't horrible. It wasn't a really horrible movie, but it wasn't great either. Um, it is a miss for me, but I would say if you want to check it out, it's on Netflix right now. And you just need something to watch, something new, and you haven't checked it out. Check it out. You may end up liking it. But I really didn't like it. But I don't regret watching it. And so with that said, that will end this episode of the podcast. I thank you guys for listening. And if this is your first time listening to the podcast and you like what you heard, go ahead and give this video a, a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And um, I don't know if I'm going to have another episode of the podcast later on this week. But if I don't, then I'll catch you guys next Monday for another edition of the Take One Podcast. So with that said, peace out. Hey, hey, before you guys leave, make sure you hit that like button as well as that subscribe button. And you see that little bell? Make sure you hit that to turn on your notifications. That way you'll be notified for anything that appears on my channel. Hope to see you guys next time. Peace out.